Hello and welcome to another Macbeth video trying to get you the very top grades with just one quotation. Yes, it is possible. So the quotation is, here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. This, of course, is Lady Macbeth doing her sleepwalking scene and she's imagining Duncan's blood still on her hand when, of course, it has been washed off. It represents her sense of guilt and her fear of hell. And in this essay, I'm going to link it to the four main themes that you could possibly be asked on. So this is the patriarchal society, the influence of Christianity on the thinking at the time, the idea of the great chain of being, which translates Christianity into a political system, and the idea of our fate and destiny versus free will. And along the, de along the way, we'll relate that quotation to definitely these seven things. And if I'm inspired, I might do the other three. So let's focus in on the patriarchal society, which is run by men, for men, and at the expense of women. Well, here we can see the social pressure on women to perfume themselves, to make themselves acceptable to men. But this is all done through disguise. In other words, in the patriarchal society, women are taught to present themselves falsely in a way that they are not. And that's a theme throughout the play where Lady Macbeth tells Macbeth to be false, to present a false front. To beguile the time, she says, look like the time. It links to that quotation in my other video, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. And then if we focus on the words sweeten and little, we can see how society has forced women to behave. They are little because they are insignificant compared to, mar to, to men. And they must sweeten themselves because they are not allowed ambition of their own. They must instead merely attract male power and achieve any influence they can that way. Now, this happens at the end of Lady Macbeth's time in the play, and it suggests that she now regrets being independent, asking for power, and she now wants to conform to society's view of womanhood and make herself small and attractive again. And the natural consequence of that is that women are taught to punish themselves for their own ambition. And that's why Shakespeare has her commit suicide. Macbeth wouldn't dream of killing himself. He goes out in battle because men are taught to die fighting, to fight to the bitter end. So they use their violence outwardly, whereas women, because they are oppressed, are taught to use their violence internally. They turn it on themselves. And that's the reason why Lady Macbeth can't kill Duncan, but she can kill herself. So in the end, Lady Macbeth's tragedy is that she ends up conforming to society's view of what womanhood should be, and she simply ends her life. Now, there is an issue with Christianity here, because if you commit suicide uh, at this time, the idea... The belief was that your soul would go to hell. Well, this links us to the idea that even if all the perfumes of Arabia were spread on her hand, you'd still be able to smell that blood. And so she's envisaging here God's omnipotent view, and omniscient rather, who can see everything, and God can see the level of her sins. She realises that she's never going to be able to escape his judgment and so kills herself now, rather than live with her sense of guilt. Well, this is an interesting proposition, because what she's suggesting here is that living on Earth is a worse hell than the hell she's going to by committing suicide. So we can see this as a warning from Shakespeare within the play, that if you commit regicide, or you aid and abet regicide, you will actually destroy your own happiness on Earth, and your punishment on Earth will be this kind of mental torment, which is worse than the physical torment you might experience in Hell itself. 
So again, Shakespeare is promoting the social order. Now, it's very easy to relate that to the great chain of being. In this political and Christian belief, God sits at the summit, at the top end of this chain. Beneath him are the angels. Then you have the leader of the church, the Pope, and then the various kings and queens that God has appointed divinely. Well, the reason for this belief, it's not in the Bible, of course, is that it makes political power permanent. It says that the kings and queens belong there because God has placed them there, and therefore any um, attack against those kings and queens is an attack against God and will therefore lead to your eternal damnation. Now, we've no idea whether Shakespeare believed this, but the audience for his play is King James, and we can be certain that King James had that view, and therefore the political message is one that Shakespeare gives because he knows that King James will like it. King James is his patron, and this play isn't simply written to entertain. It's written to reinforce that political message that King James is appointed by God and rules, therefore, by divine right. Next, we look at the idea of fate and destiny. So, what is Lady Macbeth's fatal flaw, her hamartia? Well, of course, it was her ambition and then her choice to use evil to fulfil that ambition. Well, if we focus on the word smell here, we can show that her ambition has led to a putrid odour that she cannot hide. In other words, Shakespeare's metaphor here, because obviously it's not a real smell, it's an imaginary one, is that your guilt will be so overpowering that it will destroy you and it will destroy your senses. This is a direct link to Macbeth when his sense of sight was destroyed at the moment before he killed Duncan and he imagined the hallucinatory dagger. So this attack on Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's senses is their chosen fate which is a punishment for their ambition and their hamartia. And both Lady Macbeth and her husband no longer experience reality in the same way that they did before. Their senses literally behave differently. And of course, they stop sleeping. So their minds change them physically, not just as a reflection of their guilt, but as a punishment, and you can see that as a divine punishment given by God, or a more pagan punishment produced by the fates. But the key element of tragedy, of course, is that the character brings this fate on themselves uh, through their fatal weakness, which again is her ambition. Now, Lady Macbeth could have exercised her free will by waiting, not seeking to assassinate Duncan, but just waiting for the witch's prophecies to come through naturally. In 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever, Macbeth could have become king then in some kind of natural progression, which at this present moment neither of them can foresee. Now, I'm also interested in the way that she speaks about all the perfumes of Arabia. Arabia is about as far away from England as you can get in Shakespeare's time. And although technically that is where the ingredients of the perfumes come from, it's also a symbol for Lady Macbeth wanting to get as far away psychologically from the current state she's in and get as far away from the guilt as she can. So if we take a patriarchal uh, interpretation here where Shakespeare is against women, will say that he merely wants to portray her as weak and her own self-image about how she could become strong and powerful and being unsexed was simply self-delusion. She was never able to do it because women are mentally less strong than men and that's why her mind gives out even before Macbeth's. Conversely, we might look at it a different way and say that Shakespeare is criticising the patriarchal society and therefore 
her tragedy at the end is that she cannot die defiantly. Do you remember when Macbeth worried about failing and said, if we fail, you know, what if we fail? And she just replied, we fail. For Lady Macbeth, the prize of becoming queen was worth the risk of failure. But now, once she's become queen, she seems to regret that and regress to this stereotype of a powerless woman, a mentally weak woman. And Shakespeare could be arguing that it is society that has driven her towards that. And if we go a little bit further, the representation of power, of male power in this society, is Macbeth. And what's happened? Macbeth has abandoned her. He stops sleeping with her. We know this because she sleepwalks alone and Macbeth has never seen it. He's only heard it reported by the maid. He's definitely not heard what she's saying because if he had, he would never let the doctor overhear it. Lady Macbeth says to him, why do you keep alone? Um, when he's about to kill Banquo, he will not tell her his plans. He says, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. In other words, as soon as he becomes king, he completely cuts his wife off from that partnership that he promised. Do you remember he said, my dearest partner in greatness when he wrote to her, but now he's completely cut her off from that promise. He has exercised the ultimate power in the land to make her little, to exclude her. And why has he done that? because she has become a strong and critical woman. She's told him that the ghost of Banquo Inn is not real. She's criticised his masculinity by calling him cowardly. And his revenge is to take away the equality he promised her. He promised her a partnership in greatness, and instead she is now very much the junior, the little partner. And this, I think, leads directly to her turning her violence towards herself. Now, your choice then is to say, well, where does Shakespeare sit? Does he sit over here on the side of society saying that's exactly what women should be like, sweet and little? Or does he sit on this side saying, no, this society is wrong, it treats women as inferior and we need to change that? Uh, personally, I go with that view. And one of the bits of evidence that I like to use is Shakespeare's marriage to Anne Hathaway. He's married a woman eight years older than him. And uh, we can infer from this that he's deeply attracted to a more powerful woman who is more his equal. And you can certainly look at the psychological portrayal of Lady Macbeth in terms of the actor's craft. It's a, a brilliant part to give a woman. Now obviously it wouldn't have been acted by a woman at that time but it is a portrayal of a woman with a deep understanding of her position in society and a need to change that position because it simply isn't fair. And we can add to that the weird sisters who are excluded from society because of their poverty and their awful appearance and that could also be a reason why they then choose to try and acquire some sort of power through witchcraft or supernatural influence over Macbeth. But that's just my view. You don't have to agree with it. Uh, you can interpret it the other way and say that Shakespeare is actually highly critical of female ambition. Um, and you could even use the evidence of King James taking over from Elizabeth I and Shakespeare wanting to show that a male king is such a welcome relief after the female virgin queen who reigned for so long. It really is up to you. But in both of those arguments, I used some context from the time, uh, which you must do in order to justify your point of view for the top grades. So we've touched on Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, the supernatural guilt, the morality. That comes to the um, great chain of being and Christianity that we talked about. We talked about the nature of power and how when we looked at the patriarchy and we haven't really talked about kingship other than to show how Macbeth excludes Lady Macbeth 
once she also becomes queen. Uh, I'm not going to take you through how we can use it to write about Banquo, Duncan and Macduff, because it's already 15 minutes long and uh, the exam's coming up. So, uh, give me some comments if this was a helpful video, uh, or actually if it wasn't, if you can think of some improvements, and uh, see you soon on my channel. Don't forget to subscribe.